Hello and welcome. You're watching To The Point. For many people today, the most worrying development is what they consider the spreading mood of intolerance in the country, as well as the weak, if not ineffective, response of the government. Over 400 writers, artists, authors, playwrights, many of them scholars, scientists and historians, have returned their awards or even signed statements in protest. But the government has dismissed these as manipulated, as politics by another means, and even as rabid anti-BJP elements. Today, speaking for the first time, is one of India's great public thinkers, a former editor, a former author, and a former minister in Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government, Arun Shori. Arun Shori, in the wake of the meat and beef bans and the Dadri lynching, the murder of nationalists and Dalit children, the treatment of Sudhindra Kulkarni and Gulam Ali, many people believe that a mood of intolerance is spreading through the country. Do you agree with that interpretation, or do you think it's an exaggeration? No, it's certainly um, uh, it's certainly the fact. These things are occurring one after the other. They are occurring pervasively across the country, and as you write this, uh, as these people rightly apprehend, uh, there is no um, response from the government. So it is right to be worried and, uh, of this uh, about this. I'll come to the government's response in a moment's time, but first. How do you explain this tide of intolerance? What do you believe is causing it? I think first there is encouragement. There is no doubt to that. As you said, we'll come to that later. But there is a basic reason also, and that is the weakening of the Indian state in general. Not a state government, but the Indian state. So any posse of bullies anywhere can get at anybody anytime and do anything to him. And no perpetrator is ever brought to book. Therefore, they feel in more and more encouraged. That is the basic reason why this is happening, and in such an atmosphere, uh, little you know, every uh, social service organization, every little group uh, starts, and every political party starts gathering strong arm men uh, to its own cadre, so that they can deploy them whenever they like, not, and not just in elections. Many people believe that because Narendra Modi in May 2014 won 282 seats, giving the BJP a majority for the first time in its history, extremist and fringe elements associated with the party have become emboldened. They are now asserting themselves with impunity. Is that one of the explanations? I think that's a very important inference that one should, uh, that even Mr. Modi should um, look at. Because a ruler is known people get to know him by his own character that shows up by the character of the persons he surrounds himself with and by the character of the persons who feel encouraged because he's sitting on top and there is no doubt that many of these people draw inspiration from what was said during the election campaign you know this beef business but if you look go back to the election speeches of mr modi himself there's all the talk about pink revolution so they feel encouraged and then an atmosphere is created not just by what you call fringe elements they are members of parliament they are his own ministers they are these uh, so-called bhaktas on social media and he invited those very bhaktas to uh, his house and held a reception for them uh, two of my journalist friends told me that when they saw Are, this is the man he uses the vilest abuse on social media. So why will they not feel encouraged? You're saying a very important thing. You're saying it all, in a sense, goes back to the speeches Mr. Modi made about pink revolution. That's led to meat bans, beef bans. Worse still, that's directly led to the Dadri lynching. No, no, no. That is too far, uh, stretching it too far. But I was saying that in the beef business, not everything, but in the beef business, I was giving an example that that particular thing can also be linked to what they heard in the speeches. They were encouraged by it? I would feel that, yes. And they were also encouraged by the fact that the people around Mr. Modi yes. say provocative things and he says nothing to stop them. Absolutely. And it almost comes out as if it is by design. An incident occurs that is then kept or occurs or is created then that is kept alive by these statements every second day, three, four weeks. People say, why is Mr. Modi not speaking? In the end, he says something Delphic. Motherhood is good. So there is a real connect between the intolerance we see today and the speeches that we heard during the campaign, 
the silence of the Prime Minister and the people surrounding the Prime Minister and the fact they say outrageous things, but he does nothing to stop that. That's all connected and leading up to it. Yes, and no, but not only that. If you see, Mahesh Sharma is a minister for culture, what he says, even about Kalam. And then when you give that very Mahesh Sharma, Dr. Kalam's house, the house in which Dr. Kalam stayed, do you feel that others will not feel encouraged, that that is the way to be rewarded? It's like spitting in the face of the people. You know, if I may just uh, may, uh, remind you, there's a phrase, me ne frego, I don't give a damn. That was Mussolini's phrase, his motto for his black shirts. I don't give a damn. Modi's attitude you suggest is similar. No, I'm not saying it's similar, but it is an inference that it is an attitude which will lead to the same consequences as. I'm, please don't think that I'm comparing Modi to Mussolini, not at all. But the, but attitude, the trend is the same. The attitude. Of this Mahesh Sharma thing is really symbolic. Now today, perhaps as many as 400 actors, historians, scientists, filmmakers and a variety of scholars have either returned their awards or signed statements of protest. In the present circumstances, do you believe that was the right thing to do? Of course. It is the Gandhian thing to do. And I'll, to put your uh, 400 figure into perspective, I'll tell you, in 1921, in the non-cooperation movement, the Congress, led by Gandhiji, appealed to the people, those who hold titles should return them. I looked up the figures. In August 1921, there were 5,186 persons who had titles. Do you know in six months how many returned them? 24. Here there is no Gandhi. And yet, as you say, 400 people have felt it, have, have, been, have felt compelled to state their protest and warning in public. The BJP, on the other hand, has at least on four different levels not just criticized these protesters, but condemned them. To begin with, Arun Jaitley has said these protests are manipulated. He says it's politics by other means. More importantly, he says these are rabid anti-BJP elements. How do you respond to that critique? Rabid? Rabbit means not just expressing yourself in an extreme language. These people have spoken softly. It means you suffer from rabies. Professor C. N. R. Rao, the most distinguished, one of the most distinguished scientists of India, Bharat Ratna awardee, he's a rabbit. Narayan Murthy is rabbit. Dr. Balram, who was the head of the Indian Institute of Science for eight years, who speaks so softly that you have to strain to hear him, he is rabbit. Dr. Bhargav is rabid. These are people who have, you know, these chaps who make these statements, they don't know these scientists. They don't, they have not read a book in 20 years. In fact, the list purportedly includes Admiral Ramdas, yes. Raghuram Rajan. Uh, Raghuram Rajan now just now has spoken at the Delhi IIT con uh, convocation. He's rabid. A second critique made of these protesters, again made by the BJP, is that they didn't protest during the emergency. They didn't protest in 1984 when the six killings were happening. They didn't even protest when under Manmohan Singh, scam after scam was happening. Therefore, they are hypocrites. They have no right to protest today. My friend, you certainly can't say that about me on all those three, four points. But second, the point is that was factually wrong. It turned out in Nayantara Hagel's case. I knew her during the emergency. When, uh, when JP set up the Citizens for Democracy and the People's Union for S uh, Civil Liberties, she was one of the most important pillars there. But, but uh, you, you accept that. Do you know, Gandhiji never spoke up very strongly against the Holocaust of the Jews. In fact, he entered into a, an embarrassing correspondence with Martin Buber and other Jewish uh, uh, Jewish philosophers. Suggesting they should throw themselves off a cliff. No, no, be. not only that, he said they are not entering the gas chambers with a smile in their, on their face. And they are not having goodwill towards Hitler in their hearts. I've reproduced all this correspondence. But the point was, therefore, all his protests are uh, not to be taken note of. What is this argument? In other words, people have a right to protest on issues that matter and that personally arouse them. They don't have to protest on everything to make one protest valid. Of course, naturally. There may be many occasions on that. I would naturally have liked everybody to protest in the emergency. 
So selective outrage is perfectly acceptable. It's not because hypocrisy. It's the, it's the issue that we should think of and what they are saying at that time. Don't paste motives. Don't uh, go into his grandfather's history at that time. A third reason given by the BJP for criticizing, if not condemning, these protesters is that these were people who enjoyed leverage, influence, and power under Congress. Now Congress doesn't exist. They are frustrated. They are disgruntled. See, this is such nonsense. I'll tell you why. Actually speaking, these chaps are troubled by these intellectuals for the opposite reason. You know, the, a true writer, a scientist true to his calling, he wants nothing from them. They cannot bribe him. Most of them they cannot frighten. That is why those intellectuals are not in the, the control of these fellows. That is what really troubles them. And they never find these motives till that intellectual has spoken against them. Then suddenly, why didn't you not discover his character before he spoke? So it's not that these people have lost leverage, it's actually that the BJP wishes it had leverage and it doesn't have leverage. That's right. And so those fellows have not lost leverage. They are the conscience of our country. They have such fine sensibilities that walking down a road, they notice things which you and I don't notice. That is why in our tradition and culture, we revere writers. We are grateful to scientists. The scientists who's uh, who are on that list are responsible for our space program, for our mathematics. And you say they are rabid? You don't know the scientists, you don't know the writers, you do not know the contribution they have made to our country. You're actually suggesting, aren't you, that the people who are protesting, be they historians, scientists, yes. authors, writers, whatever, actually represent the essence of the soul of India. They are yes. the conscience and, of India. And they are. And I can differ with them on, on the historians. I have myself written a book on their selective history. No problem. It's an intellectual discourse. You can't paste motives on them and thereby dismiss everything. This pasting of motives is a big error on the part of people like Venka and I do and other Of Jethi. course, my friend, and these are people who would not have read a book in 20 years and it is, this is the symptom of our times. People who have not read, who can't write two paragraphs, they are the ones who are now sitting in judgment on writers. So in other words, these ministers are criticizing out of ignorance? My fr yes. And the fact of the matter is, on these, you should carry this further. These fellows, are they are being invited to functions. Would, I have often asked them, would you invite this fellow if he were not a minister? Everybody says no. Then why do you invite him now? A fourth reason the BJP gives for not just criticizing but condemning these protests is to point out that what they're protesting against, for instance, the Dadri lynching happened in a Samajwadi ruled state, UP, the rationalist killings happened under Congress governments in Karnataka, Maharashtra, and yet the protesters are silent about that. They're only picking on Mr. Modi and the central government, and so the BJP says this is bias, this is imbalance. No, no, but of course the, central, uh, the state governments are also responsible. But by the same uh, logic, if this is how argument and discourse is to be con uh, conducted in Delhi, the Delhi police is under the central government. Rape after rape takes place. Should we then hold the central government responsible alone? See, this is not the way. You've made which... a very important point and I'm interrupting you. What you're really suggesting is that if the BJP's logic applies, blame the states because that's where the event happened, don't blame the center, then, that, then by that logic, when rape happens in Delhi, and there have been multiple horrible rapes, yeah. blame the central government, oh, yeah. don't blame Arvind Kejriwal. Oh, that's right. So how can you, this is not the level at which the, the discourse can take place, and the fact of the matter is that, I mean, actually, citizens are losing in this mutual blame game. Arun Shori, let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to turn to how this entire situation reflects on the Prime Minister. How do you view his silence? Do you accept the BJP claim that he doesn't have to speak on every subject? Or do you agree with his critics that his silence is permitting, worse even encouraging the intolerance? We'll be back in a moment's time. Don't go away.
Welcome back. You're watching To The Point and a special interview with one of India's great editors, authors and a former member of Atal Bihari Vajpayee's cabinet, Arun Shori. Let's come to the Prime Minister's response. Other than a small homily at an election rally in Bihar or a few anodyne comments in an interview to the Anand Bazar Patrika, the Prime Minister has largely maintained what some call a deafening silence. Many say that his silence is either permitting, worse still, it's encouraging the intolerance. The BJP, on the other hand, says the Prime Minister doesn't have to speak on every subject. Where do you stand on that issue? But you know, actually, the Prime Minister is not a section officer in the Department for Homeopathy. He is not the head of a department of government. He is the prime minister. He has to show the country the moral path. He has to set the moral standard. And as for this business of that he can't speak on any and every matter, these are any and every matters. And the fact of the matter is that he does speak on any and every matter. I request you and your viewers to look at his tweets. They are about um, you know, David Cameron's birthday. They are about, uh, you know, all sorts of... About the, Jod Singh uh, uh, illness? Il, uh, Modi Kurta. They are about um, the stampede in, in uh, uh, Mecca. They are about the loss of lives from an explosion in Ankara. In, on those very days, I found out. And if you see, 28th September, Dadri happens. Just see what, hap what is the tweet he sends out on 29th. Best wishes to Mahesh Sharmaji for his birthday. On the 30th, similar thing to the governor of Nagaland or something. On every single day when the incident occurred, right to the killing of those two little Dalit boys in Haryana, just see after that day, the next day and the next two days after that, what are the tweets he's sending out. It is on any and every subject. You're saying two very important things. I'm going to pause and take you through them in detail because I think they're fundamental. First, you're saying that side by side with the Prime Minister's deafening silence on Dadri, which truly shook the country as nothing else has in the last 70 years, the Prime Minister couldn't say a word on Dadri, but he found time to tweet on an assortment of inconsequential subjects. What does that suggest? Well, the obvious. Which is? That he decides to speak on certain things and not to speak on certain things. Does it also suggest that he simply didn't understand the importance of what had happened to Dadri? Or was he ignoring it? No, I think it's much more deliberate than just ignoring. The issue is kept alive by other persons. Don't forget, he is silent, but other persons are speaking. He wanted the others to keep it alive? But how can it not be the case? You mean to say he can't uh, dis discipline MPs of his parliament? You can't have it both ways. On the one side, oh, he's a very strong leader. Oh, he knows everything. He knows what, uh, what uh, clothes his ministers are wearing, and he makes them change their clothes. He gets them back from restaurants. He knows everything. But he does not know what is going on on statements. He is a very strong leader, but he cannot discipline his own ministers. Why do you think he deliberately chose to keep silent? Was it because he thought that Dadri would work in his party's political interest and he wanted that to happen? Or was it because somehow he's under pressure from forces that won't let him speak out? What was it? No, no, no. There is no pressure on him. It is his own choice. A political decision? I would think so. A I'm very sorry to say so. A political decision in the belief it would benefit to keep quiet. And there's a much worse problem. The problem is he does not realize the consequences of silence or of such incidents. Kashmir, you know how delicate the situation is in Kashmir. And what happened as a result? Some he, truck driver is beaten, uh, killed, then some MLA is beaten up, and you suddenly give uh, sort of credence to the voice of the secessionists. You know, Mr. Shori, what you're suggesting to me? The Prime Minister is deliberately playing with fire without realizing fire can burn him. Not only him, my friend, the country. So he's running a huge risk. And only for an, ele for an election in one state. It's a very, very big problem. Bihar, I'm, I'm so sad about this. Bihar about this is sense the of motivation. I would presume so. There was another very important consequence of what you said about the Prime Minister. You said the Prime Minister is not just a section officer in the Department of Homeopathy. He's the Prime Minister. He is therefore the moral leader of the country. He has Do you to be. believe that when something like Dadri shakes the country, 
he has a duty to enunciate a position around which we as a nation can rally and he failed to fulfill that duty. Of course, of course. That's what prime ministers are for. They are not for running departments. So he's actually failed to fulfill the responsibility of a prime minister? Of, of that one, one very important foundational responsibility of setting the moral standard and of showing the moral paths. Is that because he didn't realize that it was his duty or because he consciously chose to ignore it because for Bihar reasons and political reasons it didn't suit him? I, I can't uh, go, go into his uh, mind but I certainly would I mean, just from the inference of what has happened, I would think it is the latter. We're talking about the Prime Minister. This is not about the direct subject of intolerance, but it's so connected that I want to bring it up. The Prime Minister made a speech first in Buxor, then he repeated it almost verbatim 24 hours later in Patia, where he publicly, repeatedly accused Nitish Kumar and Lalu Yadav of stealing, and those were his words, 5% quotas from OBC's Dalits and Maha Dalits to give to an unnamed religious community. He never named the community, but we all knew it was Muslims. Is there a real danger here that he was pitting community against community? But of course, that was the purpose. There can be no doubt. And that, that the, the, the important point to see is not just that speech, but it is combined with the speech of Amit Shah about Pakistani crackers. But it is very important to see the fact that these gentlemen feel that they can do or they should do anything and everything to win a mere election, irrespective of its long-term consequences. Victory, that is which is a big, very big problem. Victory for the BJP has become more important than the safety, unity and integrity of India. That's what you're suggesting. Uh, well, yes. That, uh, for the consequences that will have for the safety, unity and integrity of the country. On May the 26th, when he took his oath of office, he promised to do right by all manner of men. Yes. When he pits community against community, is there a danger that he's breaching that solemn commitment? But of course, no doubt on that. He's breaching his commitment of office, to his the, oath of office. Yes, and not just because there are words in the oath, but because these are solemn things. It's a solemn compact with the people of the country. He's broken that compact? Uh, unless he mends unless he mends he will break it he, yes let's come to the overall situation that emerges today two months of this has gone on non-stop yet i remember that just 18 months ago mr modi was elected amongst enormous euphoria there was a great belief that india was going to change a chapter had opened a new future was stretching out ahead of us how much damage has been done to that image of the bjp or is this only an urban English middle class liberal concern. This latter phrase is an absolute bunk. I've heard it since Mrs. Indira Gandhi's time. During the emergency, they said, oh, these protests, your uncle Ramesh Thapar and everybody, we used to be together. And they were accosted on this. Small people like me were accosted. Kya bakwas kar rahe ho? This is only, a protest is only in Delhi. When we started raising the writing about the corruption, they said, it is only this middle class concern. It's not. Then elections were lost. Look at the big corruption to issue the. So also in this case, how can we presume that the unity of the country is just an urban, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Newton's Delhi phenomenon? But these issues of intolerance matter as much to rural India, Hindi and because actually regional speaking, language speaking India as they do to you and me in English. But, uh, but actually speaking even more because their life is intertwined. In urban areas it's not that intertwined. So the impact is greater in rural India. And when the thing, when the fire starts there, it is much more difficult to put it off, put it out. So when you say that the fabric of India could be torn, it's first going to be torn no, in no. rural the, India. Uh, India will survive these people, but when it does, they, you know, hundreds and thousands of people just, I mean, hundreds of persons die. That should be a matter of great concern. Now, the Prime Minister spends a lot of time, a lot of effort, and he's done it successfully so far, traveling the world, inviting them to come and make an India, to come and invest. But recently, Major papers like the New York Times and the Financial Times have written adverse articles about the growing mood of intolerance. Moody's Analytics has now publicly warned the Prime Minister that this could have a serious impact on growth, on development, on investment. 
Has India's international economic standing taken a knock? Yes, well, certainly the investors are very concerned. I get to meet them every fortnight, and they are certainly this is an added factor because it's especially because it comes on the top of um, the lunacy and um, uh, and uh, waywardness in our tax administration. It comes in our announcements on economic policy and on you know on various uh, catapult on the somersaults that have been ha uh, the, that have been happening on economic policy it comes in the way of uh, in the, on top of confrontations with one institution after another the latest being the judiciary it comes on after uh, f uh, these uh, great mistakes uh, these great blunders like the three ordinances on the land acquisition act so when it comes on top of all that then people say Are, yeah, maybe development is a mask the talk of development is a cover. They start worrying. They don't want to get caught, not just caught in their own investments. They do not want to get caught in legitimizing something that is so fundamentally wrong. So today when the Western world looks at the intolerance, the killings, the bans, and then they look at the silence of the Prime Minister, and they look at the outrageous comments being made by his ministers and his failure to stop them, are you saying to me that they might actually say to themselves, hang on, is this the country I really want to put money into? Will they now start having second and third thoughts? No, you see, because, yes, the, India is a great market, um, opportunity, good work is being done on this ease of doing business by Amitabh Kant and a few other officers. But yes, that would certainly be a matter of concern to them. It will be just a doubt. It doesn't mean that they won't come in at all. But do you think Mr. Modi realizes that he's actually developing a situation that runs counter to his entire development plans for India? It runs counter to his promise that India will develop and grow. Well, you know, I think, I do not, maybe there's a, con a conceptual difference. His concept of development seems to be a few large projects. And he may feel that in spite of all this, I can execute a few large projects. The statue of Sardar Patel um, made in China. Chinese workers to put it together. But, Maybe development, but development for the poor will not happen. Will may not happen. Yes. So finally then, how does this reflect on the image of the Prime Minister? We voted him with so much hope. For so many he was an icon. You were a great supporter yes, of yes. him before the May elections. Yes, sir, you I were am. an advisor of his. No, how does too... today his image stand in your eyes? I certainly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm nobody to claim that I was an advisor or anybody, but I certainly did support him. I expected very different things uh, from his uh, tenure, uh, from his doing things, from, in, from his priorities. I guess those were wrong. But I encapsulate to you what you said about his image today, just by reference to the Bihar election that you were talking about earlier. You know, a Bihar friend of mine, I had asked him, Ki, kya, what is the situation today? He put it very well. He said, Ji, jab, sir, ye jab election shuru hui, to hamare do provincial politician the, Lalu Yadav aur Nitish Kumar. Aur vahaan Yug Purush the, world famous leader Narendra Modi. Ab jo election ka campaign hua hai, usse Narendra Modi sahab aur Lalu, wo apne aapko Lalu Yadav ji ke Star par le aaye hain, aur Nitish Kumar ji statesman lagte hain. So the campaign has diminished, Mr. Modi. I think so. I think so. The words are not befitting of a prime minister. And it's certainly, Amit Shah saying um, that oh, Pakistan may crackers honge. Actually, that is wrong, because I'll tell you, in Pakistan the situation is they have already celebrating. Why? You, you would have seen Ayaz Amir's article the other day. He's one of the main, uh, big commentators and a very good thinker. What did he say? He said that Narendra Modi is the best thing that has ever happened to Pakistan. Because he, while Pakistan is getting out of the fundamentalist ditch and while we are getting control over Karachi, he is pushing India into the same ditch. In other words, Already the Pakistani commentators are saying that it's totally fine. They wrote a letter and they circulated it. Oh, brother, you are totally like us. In other words, Modi and Amit Shah are reducing India to a situation akin to Pakistan, no, uh, whilst Pakistan is getting out of that groove. That's what I as Amir and all have said. One more question. What does Mr. Modi's handling of this situation, I'm talking both about his prolonged silence except for that brief homily and that brief interview, as well as his 
repeated failure to curb or admonish his ministers and MPs who've often said outrageous things. What do these two together reveal of Mr. Modi? I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I would certainly not want to believe that those fellows reflect his own beliefs. And yet he's silent. That's why. In fact, his no, no. silence encourages yeah, them. Yes. I would not like to believe that, that, is, uh, that they are reflecting his beliefs, because then it is the end of the matter. Are you disturbed by the way Mr. Modi is presenting, behaving, conducting himself? Uh, yes, I, am, uh, I was disappointed on these small things like the economy, but on this matter, yes, I am disturbed. This is a Lakshman Rekha that has No, been that's too big a word. But yes, it is a, a disturbing for, because the consequences are not just that the growth will not be that much. Or that many jobs will not be What is the consequence? The consequence is social disturbance in the country. You know, I tell you, how many Muslims we have now? 17 crore. Okay, 170 million. If 170 of them decide, Dekha, Bilkul Thik Pata, Islamic State is right. We don't see that danger. He's threatening the integrity of the country. And he, he is, no, that's a big phrase. Integrity will, be, will survive all of everybody, including us. But yes, he is set, uh, endangering, he is it. endangering it, putting into unnecessary, uh, taxing it unnecessarily. Arun Jaitley in his blog says the Prime Minister is the greatest victim of intolerance. Do you accept that? Uh, you know, apart from I mean, uh, the perverse statements, Apart, this is the most dangerous statement of all the ones that have been made. Because when a ruler believes, or when he is made to believe that he is a victim, then in his mind he gets the fullest justification for vengeance. That is terrible. In other words, Arun Jaitley, without realizing it, is giving Mr. Modi the grounds to be vengeful. Of course. I have to ask you this, because there are many who will be hearing you, and many are going to turn around and say, Arun Shori used to be an admirer, he was very close to him. Not close. But... Maybe he's speaking today because he didn't get a job. Maybe these are sour grapes. Is there a personal motivation behind your criticism? Because this is the second time you've come on an interview. The first time you were sharply critical of his economic handling. Today you're sharply critical and deeply worried about freedom of expression and the Prime Minister's lack of response. Is there something personal? No, I, you know, the point is that uh, the best answer to this is you assume the worst motives for me. But what about the facts? They're inescapable. Uh, I remember a day, you know, Antule, when I wrote about Antule, he's a, he planted a story in a magazine published from Bombay. No, 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 he is doing this because Antule has spoken against arms, American arms aid to Pakistan and he's a CIA agent and he is using, he is using the illness, the, the excuse of the illness of his son to visit his foreign bosses abroad regularly. That was the allegation that was put against me. And what happened? So, believe the worst about the motives, but the fact of the matter is that these things disturb everybody. You're saying and, very... and they have developed, this is a contamination they have got, if I may use the worst abuse for them, this is the contamination they have picked up from the communists, these uh, fellows. The BJP because, huh? has picked up <laughs> yes. contamination because, from the communists. Because the communists used to always label, a motive, paste a motive on the other fellow and dismiss his argument. The BJP today says <laughs> you're not even a member of the BJP. Ah, very good. Are you saying to me, you're deeply disillusioned with the party you were once a member of, whose cabinet you once served in? Are no, you no, today disillusioned with the BJP? No, the, the, forget the BJP, but you know this business of not being a member. Uh, I am a graduate of Ramnath Goenka school. That when a guest is coming, don't leave any knives and forks on the table which he may use to stab you. So, what could they do to an ordinary member? At best, they can expel him. So if you are not a member,
You therefore <laughs> deliberately no, no, no. chose no, no, am, not to renew I am not your saying membership. That. I am just I am giving you a proposition of Ramnaji. So don't think everything happens. But on the its inference own. is clear. You deliberately chose not to renew your membership so that they couldn't expel you. Had no, you no, continued no. Actually to speak speaking, up. somebody came at uh, some stage with my good friend Rajesh Jain's thing. You know that those mobile numbers you have to send a missed call. You have to make. So I said I don't want. To. So somebody said, "Nee, you are here. You have to give us mobile. We will do it. Whatever you want to do, you have to do it." Arun Shari, you have a tradition of ending interviews with chosen couplets that sum up not just the mood of the moment, but how you see the mood of the country. Do you have a couplet today that sums up what, for many, is a very disturbing and disconcerting atmosphere? Well, actually, it applies to all rulers, not just to Mr. Modi, but not to every minister, to every chief minister, to everybody. And it is not uh, it is not a Doha, but it is a couplet. It is not in Hindi. It is in Urdu. And it is not by an Indian uh, poet, but by a Pakistani poet, Havi Jalib. He wrote that तुझ से पहले वो एक शख्स जो यहाँ तख्त नशी था, he who before you adorned this very throne, तुझ से पहले वो एक शख्स तो जो यहाँ तख्त नशी था उसको भी अपने खुदा होने का उतना ही युक्ति था। Translate that for those who don't follow in Urdu। Yes, that there the person who adorned this throne before you, he was also as convinced as you are that he is the eternal God, and see where he is today. And that is a message that would be crystal clear to everyone hearing but, this interview. But it should be um, clear to every ruler, Pakistani, Indian, chief minister, minister. Prime but Everybody. perhaps first it should be clear to our rulers. Arun Shori, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you.